Good evening, all. We're getting ready to talk with several guests that I'm really excited to introduce you to, and the topic of tonight is the miniaturization of medicine and its impact on cardiography, so, uh, or cardiology, sorry. I have uh, several guests here tonight, and we're, we're going to start by talking about Partho Sengupta. Partho is someone that I just met recently. Um, he recently did the World Summit. Uh, airing the live broadcast and he has a long laundry list of things that he's recently gotten attention for. He is, um, he, like about a year ago, was it a year ago, Partho, that you did the um, holograph presentation that is how I found you? Yes, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. Yes. So um, Partho is the Director of Cardiac Ultrasound Research in Core Lab and an Associate Professor of Medicine in Cardiology at Mount Sinai. Um, he has a, a lot of credentials here, but it's more interesting to know a little bit about what his special interest is in cardiology. So, Partha, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what your special interests are in this field? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. First of all, what a great pleasure to be here in this hangout. And um, I think uh, um, as I introduce myself, um, uh, I'm really very passionate about uh, the uh, acceleration and the disruption of the technology that we are experiencing and how we are really on a, a paradigm uh, shift uh, that we all are going to currently experience in the field. Um, so embracing the change is one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, tasks that we all have to set up and we are, I'm, I feel myself um, a part of that big change and uh, in that process, uh, my focus is currently on cardiovascular illness, uh, early detection uh, and uh, uh, prevention. Plus also I work uh, in the field of structural heart disease uh, imaging and where there's a really great uh, uh, innovation that is happening in the field. So um, plus in addition, I, I'm really technologically um, trying to link myself uh, and liberate myself off uh, uh, the uh, different uh, silos and the barriers that uh, medicine in general has been practicing over the years and uh, really looking for this uh, uh, collaborative uh, effort to, to move on to the future in the field of uh, cardiology. Well, and I'm really looking forward to having you dive into the, the topic of the article that was recently uh, published that you um, you wrote and you brought these guests all together to kind of dive into. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. I want to introduce the other guests that we have. Um, we have uh, Doc, we have Manuel, Manuel, I, Manny, can I just call you Manny? Manny. <laughs> Avaricio. <laughs> um, I have been really lucky to get to know all these people through Partho. And he is a co-founder and former CEO, now this the chief memory maker of Cephron Technology. And uh, he has come to be uh, guest here to talk about his part in the information that was processed through this article and all that we discussed. Can you tell us a little bit about Saffron and about uh, your part that you played in some of this so we can get a background of, of who you are and what makes you tick and what makes you a chief memory maker? Yes. <laughs> um, so thanks Kathy for the opportunity and really thank Partho. Uh, my thanks to Partho for, for uh, engaging me in his uh, incredible vision. I, I was at uh, his presentation with the uh, uh, holographic projection and the content was, was fabulous. So it's a real revolution he's leading. And, and our part is, is really in the data analytics. So Saffron technology is what uh, you'd now start uh, hearing is cognitive computing. Um, so from a bit of personal background, um, I'm really a psychologist, a neuropsychologist by training. Um, and always the business intelligence and artificial intelligence, uh, consumer intelligence as not really intelligent, not, not really what this is. So um, uh, we founded, uh, I was with IBM for 12 years, but uh, we founded Saffron Technology in 1999 uh, to really, you know, crack this nut. Um, how do we think, how do doctors think? Uh, what is real intelligence as we talk about smart devices, you know, we're using this word smart. Um, how do we really make uh, computers smarter, at least, to, to, to assist us better? Uh, we've been in national security and manufacturing, um, a lot of uh, different industries, but uh, healthcare is, is a lifelong passion, 
And again, with Partho, um, uh, looking looking to address healthcare now is a, a, you know big data and lots of lots of change going on in how to address big data. And big data is really a buzzword around here right now. So um, I'm sure we have lots of people interested in knowing how big data plays a part in the whole story we're going to paint for people tonight. Um, before we get into that, however, I'd like to introduce the third guest, which is Jeffrey Sobel. He is Associate Professor of Medicine, Chief of Cardiology, Clinical Consultant Service, oh, and so on and so on. But the most important thing is he is with Telehealth Now. And this is where he came into play with this uh, whole project that we had. So, um, Jeff, would you mind telling us a little bit about your part in this and about Telehealth Now and uh, tell us where you are with it? Sure. Thank you, Kathy. And again, thank you, Partho, for bringing me into the discussion tonight. Um, you know, part I had the good fortune of connecting with uh, Partho over projects that we're doing in telerobotic ultrasound, which is the focus of Telehealth Now, um, and ways that that would intersect with his vision of bringing together um, more accessibility for advanced diagnostic services and and the data uh, component as well. My background is um, actually as a clinical cardiologist at Rush University Medical Center for well over 20 years. I can't believe that. Uh, I've also been involved with um, one of the primary drivers of cardiology data systems uh, and IT systems over the past 15 to 20 years, a company called uh, CyberPulse, which was a pioneer in the structured reporting area, but now my focus is with uh, telehealth now in the area of telerobotic ultrasound and it's really predicated on the convergence of um, technology and cost factors in high-end robotics and control systems that we can now put to work uh, along with mobile um, ultrasound in order to really expand the accessibility of this kind of technology, both geographically and temporally, um, make it available to uncouple, so to speak, the need to have trained sonographers at the point of care for ultrasound, which is really a core technology, both in cardiology and <clears throat> across almost all of the subspecialties. Uh, so Partho shared our vision of what telerobotic ultrasound could bring, and uh, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with him and, and others on um, working to try and bring that to market. We're, we're currently in uh, the mode of beginning clinical trials and continuing to uh, fundraise, so if there's anybody out there that uh, has an interest in this area, uh, we'd love to hear from them. That's wonderful, and I want everyone to know that's watching, if you have any questions as we're having this conversation, feel free to post the questions. I have enabled the questions app, so if you're on the event page of Google+, you should be able to enter a question there. If for some reason it's not working, feel free to post it right onto the event page, and I'll be monitoring the event page off to the side while we're having this conversation, and I will interject your questions as we go on. Um, I want to get right to uh, Partho, and I want, to, I want to give everybody a concept of why we're having this conversation because you had a very interesting point that you shared with me of why this is such an important topic to discuss right now and can you please share a little bit of that with us all? Yeah, thank you Kathy. Uh, first of all, again, uh, just an honor to be here um, at basically uh, the reason we're discussing cardiovascular illness is, uh, let me start by giving you an estimate of the problem. So if you just go by the doctor, one in three person who dies, dies of cardiovascular disease across the globe. And although in the developed countries we have attained some reduction in the mortality, what we are seeing is an escalating proportion of patients who are aging who are going to land up with cardiovascular disease as a disability. And just to give an estimate, uh, uh, it's, it's been projected that by 2030, one in 30 persons around you is going to be having a cardiovascular disability and failure, heart failure related problem. And what will that lead to is enormous uh, consumption of uh, cost. Uh, again, a projection is it's going to 
double up. It's currently estimated about twenty-one billion dollars. It's going to go about fifty-three billion dollars by twenty thirty. So you can see this enormous cost that is going to be a challenge for all of us. So the question, therefore, is that's being posed is what is how do we handle this epidemic of uh, uh, cardiovascular illness and disability? The answer is going to be prevention and early detection and uh, trying to keep people out of the hospital and to the best possible way. And so for early detection, if you want to target, uh, the only way to do an early detection uh, is to use a technology that will be something similar to an advanced physical evaluation. and. The closest analogy therefore comes as cardiac ultrasound is because you can readily image it, you can do it at the backside, you can do it in the heart of the community, you can do it anywhere, it's portable. And there is significant miniaturization of the uh, hardware that you can carry in your pocket. So that's that's something that has happened over a period of time. It's just like our smartphones have evolved. Now, just having the ability to image will not be sufficient we would have to make the entire process, starting from data acquisition, image acquisition, to its interpretation and analysis, far more efficient so that we can have far more number of studies done for the same cost. Um, so the entire efficiency, the entire throughput structure needs to be uh, altered. And that's where we need Automatic, uh, you know, you you need automated analytical uh, uh, an analysis, use of robotic arm for more efficient data acquisition. Uh, that's where the entire uh, uh, scene is is worth uh, looking at. So, if you have some increased efficiency and throughput using robotic arms, and once the image has arrived, have advanced analytics so that we improve the time required for diagnosis and we automate the entire process. That's going to increase the yield and that's going to allow us to do far more number of exams for a given amount of money, increase the yield, uh, and, and that's going to be the answer rather than curtailing the number of exams. That's not the answer because if you have a technology, you should be able to use it more frequently more efficiently rather than cutting down the number of exams. So that's the philosophy that I believe is going to allow us to go into the future uh, in the field of uh, uh, early detection and prevention and also for taking care of those who are going to suffer with cardiac ailments as the, as the numbers are going to be increasing over the period of time. So how did you try to test this theory? Well, um, you know, it's interesting that you should ask this question. So we did some pilot projects, and uh, along with the American Society of Echocardiography, we used uh, a miniaturized uh, ultrasound uh, system, uh, V-scan, uh, in remote corner, in a rural corner of India. And we scanned 1,024 patients in less than 48 hours by nine sonographers and uploaded the entire data sets uh, over the World Wide Web and had it distributed through a cloud-based technology called a study cast to 75 centers across the world and people were already there logging into the computers, they reported the images and the studies were back within uh, close to eight hours uh, median time interval. And we followed these patients up over a period of time all those who had structural heart disease and problems that they detected. And we were able to forecast their, uh, their survival trends, uh, their admission trends. So that was a big value. We found that using a portable technology like ultrasound was able to bring, when you want to go in for a mass screening, in particularly highly um, uh, prevalent population where, where the, the chances of heart disease prevalence is high. So, so by utilizing such a strategy, uh, it was called as an AAC robot study, it was finally published in the Journal of the American Society of Echo, uh, and uh, that allowed us to uh, prove the point. But not only that, we then started working this next step, how we can 
automate the process uh, without requiring for a physician or a sonographer to be present at the scene. So that's where I had the opportunity to work with Chef and we're testing some uh, uh, newer um, uh, robotic arm and devices. We did actually a transatlantic study from Germany. We were able to do some phantom studies in Boston um, and that went on very well and that was kind of the first uh, uh, effort uh, which showed the promise of long distance telerobotic echo being a reality and I mean, in the future you can think about all these ultrasound kiosks sitting in um, you know, community centers where people with problems they can go and they can log on and have a physician at a distance or a sonographer this is ready to take the images. There are so many different ramifications for all this. Uh, once the data was acquired, then we started looking into some intelligent analytics and that's where Manny and his team really have started contributing. So they take the entire unstructured echo data and, and started making sense of the data by pattern recognition um, so that you can detect the disease and abnormal from normal without even having a human interaction. So the entire data is getting up there and by training a computer, uh, uh, an algorithm, and maybe Manny can interject a little bit more about that. So that's the, and there's a direction. Even before a human interaction has happened, uh, you, you, you're going to have the information available uh, as a cross-check. Uh, you can have the pattern there, re uh, recognition available to have uh, early detection of disease. So that's what we were trying to do. We have done some of this early work with Manny also. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to go to uh, Jeff and hear a little bit from his perspective because when when Partha reached out to you, Jeff, and he told you what he wanted to do, and you were talking about the equipment, it was it was your robotics that were used in in this this measuring, right? This this whole process. Are you there? Right, in our tele robotics system. The yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, tell me a little bit about the robotics. Can you describe it a little bit to us and tell us how you were gathering the data and how it was working remotely? Give us a little picture of what was going on here. So it's a, a relatively low-cost, low-paid robotic arm with seven degrees of freedom. It's, it's highly mobile and can, can be um, directed through space, you know, in, in any way that a user would like. It's the, the system itself has um, video sensors and other sensors built in to help the remote operator um, place the probe, manipulate the probe with very fine controls. On the end that's being used by the operator, there's a video feed of, of the patient as well as a real-time video feed of the echocardiographic data, which is crucial to making those kind of minor manipulations of the probe that are necessary to optimize the, uh, the image. So our intention is, and we're well along the way, to recreating the kind of environment that is necessary to allow diagnostic imaging to be done from anywhere in the world and um, you know we think this is a big step forward and, and Partho's participation in our pilot project has been uh, very encouraging that um, this technology had, the time in essence has come for this technology to uh, turned into real-world practice and um, I think it'll have a very re revolutionary effect on cardiology and uh, potentially many area, other areas of medicine. I would also just like to add or, or maybe build a bit upon what Partha is saying about early detection, you know, uh, there's a big gap between the treatment of disease once it's already manifest, somebody's had a heart attack or a stroke or peripheral vascular disease and the traditional risk factors we talk about like diabetes and hypertension and, and ultrasound techniques and other techniques um, are really able to pick up some clinical disease, uh, potentially atherosclerotic disease, hardening of the arteries or other kinds of subclinical disease that really um, is much easier to treat before it becomes full-blown. So I think Partho's right on track when he says we 
the goal here shouldn't be to limit these technologies that have the potential to allow us to identify and treat, uh, treat disease early. It needs to be on expanding the availability and affordability and analyzability of, of the tests. And uh, that's, I think, uh, the vision that he's promoting. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'd like to go to Manny now. Um, we're going to get more into a casual conversation here, but I want to give e each of you a chance to speak because, Manny, uh, you were asked to collect and process data or to take that data and turn it into something meaningful. Can you give us a, an idea of what conversation took place? What did Partho say he was looking for that was any different than what other people w have been looking for and that you were able to do differently? Well, if, if you think both, both these gentlemen are producing massive data, and it's kind of the history of medicine, more and more data, all the instrumentation uh, for just even one patient, one heartbeat over the time course of the beat, all the locations on the heart, the specific strains. Uh, I don't even know all the measures that, <laughs> that part that was generating. Uh, he called to say, you know, I can see a pattern. And, and, you know, with his experience, with his human brain, that I can see a pattern, but none of the standard analytics that, that we tried, um, you know, is doing the same. And, and I know there must be a way. I'm looking for something new. So um, uh, to, to put some uh, definition of why I'm called the chief memory maker, um, to get back to that, is um, our brains, physicians' brains, work by practice, by experience, by memory. So they're learning, learning, learning. They're constantly learning all the time. It's not what you think of traditional data analysis of getting the data, reducing it down to a few variables, um, parameter tweaking, um, and then deploying some, some small reduced model. What Partha was faced with was, again, I recall his, the very first conversation. He said, you know, I know this is complex. All these different variables are working together. And if you take even one heartbeat, we're looking at 10,000 simultaneous variables, um, you know, all interacting with each other. It's this machine, this complex machine. Um, and again, the, the traditional statistics uh, just wasn't, wasn't cutting it. So our approach is much more cognitive, much more brain-like, always just looking at the pattern. Uh, even if we see only a few patients, we're, we're really looking at all the complexity, all the variables, how they're interacting. And uh, to a word, what we do is we build a memory. So we build a memory of cases of constrictive disease, of restrictive disease, normal. And we just see that pattern so that when we're faced with a, you know, a, a new presentation, a new, a new patient, um, it's a very natural uh, way of thinking to say, this looks more like restrictive or constrictive given that we, we've captured all this information, all the interactions and all the complexity uh, inside these, uh, in the technologies called the social memory. So unlike traditional statistics, unlike rule-based uh, traditional artificial intelligence, uh, this is much more natural. Um, it's the way our own brains think. It's uh, the way Partho's experience works in order to see those patterns. Um, and that's where uh, Saffron is, is building computers with that same philosophy, with that same approach, that natural cognitive approach um, to, to help when things get really complex and the data gets big and to word uh, the part they use, how do we go faster? How do we automate the, the analytic process or else that will be the bottleneck? Uh, everybody knows we're, we're just swimming in data. And if, it, if we don't also have the faster, uh, more natural form of analytics, um, we're not getting any value out of it. So, Parthi, are, are you suggesting that, that there is a physician's intuition that you think can be built into processing of data to look at data differently so that there's more of a humanistic interpretation of the data? Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's what uh, is medicine all about. I mean, we uh, so first of all, uh, the data is very non-linear. So you know, x plus y is not always equal to z, 
And most of the time, we spend our uh, you know times during the residency and fellowships, and we collect all these bits and pieces of associations. When I see this particular variable with this particular variable, and I say, hey, yeah, that patient did not do well. So that's how our memory has been developed. And when we next encounter after our training a given situation, we relate to that past experience, to that memory bank, and we say, you know what, this does not make sense. Or what we call as an intuitive sense is probably a subconscious level of associations that we have developed, and we try to give a justification of a decision that we are going to take for the patient. What Manny is suggesting is that it is not potentially possible to capture all these different nonlinear patterns and behaviors and develop a memory bank of association just like our brains are developed. So that when you're next exposed to a new situation that algorithm is going to be able to relate from the previous experience and uh, be able to tell you what this pattern is like. It's going to be 80% chances that this is going to rain tomorrow. I mean, something like that. Uh, you know, it's going to be, it looks like 80% that this patient, this is that patient, not this patient. So we're going to make, be able to make some quicker decisions or have at least some analytics available that, you know, the memory data suggests that this may be looking like this disease or that disease. So that will be a faster approach or at least it will enhance the, uh, the ability of a novice to be able to approach that situation rather than requiring for the person to go through four years of training to get the same degree of associations developed. And think about a virtual situation. For example, let's say we connected, let's say a hypothetical situation. We had Mount Sinai, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and everybody worked together to develop the memory of the best doctors with their memories and association trained a computer. And you have the central powerhouse station of all kinds of associations developed by best cardiologists across the world. This is going to be super uh, superseding any single humanistic ability to attain that kind of an associative skills. So that's, that's, that's going to be something that we need to develop in the future. Uh, and I think, I think Manny will have more information. There, there, there are very, it's a clear signs that he has uh, developed. And this is something not, uh, this is interesting, this is something is coming late to medicine, I would say. He's already been doing this for defense and, uh, for example, I think he can tell you in how in the Iraqi war, he's got this great story, the uh, saffron technology was able to forecast the use of uh, the oil across uh, the Gulf War and, and maybe uh, Manny can tell that this is something that has already been there for some time, right? Yeah, uh, we're, we're the, uh, there's a lot of talk about cognitive computing now. We've been operational for, for quite a long time uh, with real enterprises uh, solving you know, very serious hard problems. I, I'd like to add that this, this approach also moves to personalized medicine. So if you think about a memory base or a case base, if you will, with, as Parker said, if we can really have all of this memory of all these individual patients, the way a memory base works is to recall the experience, the experience base, recall the experience that is relevant to the new case. <laughs> so, so it's not a uh, population healthcare, it's not population statistics, it's, there's nothing general uh, about it. Given that patient, this again is the way you know doctors truly practice from their own experience. You know, this reminds me of what I've seen before. I've seen these associations before, and when I did, I applied this treatment with good effect. So that kind of memory-based, experience-based uh, way of thinking is also a way to evidence-based, personalized medicine. Uh, rather than uh, kind of a more, uh, what some people are prioritizing is, um, you know, population health care, <laughs> which is also good and, and uh, you know, has its place, but um, personalized medicine is absolutely the way to, to the evidence-based, uh, true individual health care. I'd like to to interject a question here. We have an audience question. We have several here, so I'm going to get to one of them. John Bennett had asked, 
what specific cardiac diseases do you expect or hope will be aided by massive data extraction of cardiac ultrasounds? Can you give some suggestions of specific things you learned or specific things you hope to learn um, regarding that? So is that addressed to me, Kathy? Anybody, anybody who wants to chime in, maybe all of you have something to say. I, th I think we're just uh, on the very surface. I think every single uh, disease will be potentially available. But the biggest challenge, and I think that's where I, I'm really uh, very interested to see, is, um, uh, is, is a condition called as uh, uh, dysfunction in diastole. It's a, it's a relaxation abnormality of the heart, which we now know is increasingly related to heart failure in the community and has not been addressed in the past. And we see a really a big challenge because there is no real clear algorithm. It's a huge number of variables that we use for uh, looking at uh, understanding uh, the, the disease. And, and, and in, in, in the manuscript that we wrote, we say that, you know, if you have got 10 variables and lines tell you one decision algorithm, you can have close to about factorial 10, 40,000 different looking to this data, and no wonder we sometimes are unable to categorize the patient's presentation. So this is where I think the, the highest yield is going to be more complex situation where you're going to need more number of variables. That's where it's going to be useful. So, for example, um, um, diseases like uh, so diastolic dysfunction is one, which is, again, multifactorial and is related to hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, uh, you know, you can have atherosclerotic disease, which is like narrowing of the arteries, which lead to subtle changes in the heart function, which could be detected earlier, um, and, and potentially any other uh, disease which leads to the change in the heart function, a change in the how the blood is transiting to the, uh, the cardiac chambers. We can also use this data for early detection in the arteries. For example, Jeff has uh, developed this model where you look into the carotid ultrasound and you look into the thickness of the arteries and you can dis distinguish whether there is absence or presence of uh, cholesterol building up there. And, 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 and combined with other big data about the patient, like you know his lifestyle, his smoking history, his other risk factors, you can structure the multi-parametric situation and make much more intelligent forecast about the patient's risks of having some kind of a disaster happening in the near future. So that's where I think it's going to be useful. So ultimately, I think the big data is going to, is, is going to involve and involve change in almost any, any type of disease spectrum that you currently see. Our brains are actually doing this currently. We do the big data processing. The problem is that we don't know how to reproduce it. And and, and people like Manny are like working on how to make it reproducible so that we don't always need an export all the time because an export is not going to be available all the time. We need to automate this process so that we can apply them faster and quicker at any given situation across uh, the entire globe. Uh, there's another question here. Um, this person is from, this is Karthik Madhaven. And this person says that they're a neurosurgeon at University of Miami, and they're wondering um, how how you would apply this to neurosurgery, for example, taking it outside of just cardiology and, and applying it within that field. Jeff, I don't think your sound is on. Can you can you check your mic? You might be muted. One more time, try. I'm still not hearing you. I think all of a sudden we have a sound issue with Jeff. <laughs> there we go. Nope. All right, we're having so, we're having some sound issues with Jeff. So we'll let when you get your sound in, just uh, chime in. I know Jeff said he had to leave at some point, so I don't know if if he's wanting so to. I'm, leave. Gonna, I'm I'm going to interject, try to answer that. You know, there is a lot of crosstalk between different organs. So when I say cardiovascular, it's connected to the central nervous system also. And what's interesting, there, there's recent data that if you look into the heart, you can predict who's going to develop dementia, for example. So there's a lot of cross-talking between a lot of organs. Uh, there's a lot of clustering of disease. For example, you'll be surprised that obesity, diabetes, cancer, heart disease sometimes come in cluster because there are common pathways in which disease develop around clustering of risk factors. So I'm not sure if I'm answering that question, 
But what I'm trying to say is that we're going to see a lot of interaction. It's not just related to cardiovascular system. All these risk factors are ultimately going to be able to allow us to predict in, in, in neuro neurology. And, and I think uh, Manny can probably tell a little bit more. He's a neuroscientist. So um, I'm not sure about neurosurgery and how surgical algorithms, but I'm sure there's some kind of an application even in, in neurosurgery and, and its outcomes that are going to be useful. Manny? Yeah, uh, sure. I, and again, I'm, I'm not a physician, so I'd rather uh, these two other gentlemen go for um, um, it. Partho hit the word, um, you know, you know, complex disease. Um, that's 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 really where uh, again the nonlinearity and all dimensionality. So many factors. So many. I think we're losing a connection there with Manny. In general, uh, uh, not. Not necessarily neurosurgery, but uh, in neurology, again, another extremely complex system, extremely complex system, and and as we're learning, uh, you know, diabetes is uh, maybe it extends to well, all these systems truly are complex biological systems, and therefore we need uh, uh, that lives up to that. Um, you know, we, we know the biology is complex, so why do we have, uh, you know, analytic assumptions that try and reduce it, abstract it, you know, make it simple? Uh, those, that, that just, it, it, it violates what we actually know about the biology. And I don't know, as a neuroscientist, we've got to say, uh, pardon me, Partho, for, for uh, the, the complexity of the heart, but the brain is, is obviously, you know, unfathomably complex. If, if, if there's that kind of complexity just in one area of, of expertise, and you're talking about this being a complex system of systems interacting with systems and so on, is it really possible to, to not only gather the data and to process it in, in one way, but to process it effectively, to be able to have that, I mean, that that's just unfathomable to me that you could process that data and, and get something out of it. Well, uh, eat the elephant one bite at a time, as, as we like to say. Uh, yes, that, that um, the, the, the interactions and cross-system interactions, um, Partho gave a good example, are there. Um, I, I think from a practical perspective of, of uh, um, simply starting to, to introduce the methodology to each disease. But then when you get to, to a patient, um, you know, within that EMR, there is a very particular presentation, a very particular history, which can be very, very large, but all you need to do, again, the idea of memory-based experience is even if you have all the knowledge about everything, every patient, what you want to do, even if it's petabytes, um, the idea is what megabyte do I need from my experience that is applicable to help this one individual, uh, given, again, their presentation, their history. So, so that's a, kind of a way to, to dissect it, rather than being overwhelmed with the pedibible. Everything that Partho knows in his brain. <laughs> um, all the connections that are there, that's fine. But when there's one patient, um, that, that certain associations, certain things just pop to the top of his mind from that experience. And, and, and that, I think, helps bisect the, the larger problem about, oh my god, how, how, much, you know, how big is the whole elephant? I want, to throw, I want to throw something out here real quick because there's a comment that I think really ties in nicely with what Partho had. He hasn't yet broached tonight, but we've broached in several um, private conversations, and that is um, where Google Glass might play a part in this. And, and the additional information that can be gathered, the fact that we have the augmented reality that can be gathered. And there's a post here from John Bennett that um, he's, he mentions about the use of Google Glass and his desire to um, connect with some people and talk about that. And so I want to throw that out there. Um, are, are you all familiar enough with Google Glass to know some of the capabilities of it that we can kind of dream a little bit here? Yeah. 
I have one of these. Your picture is on, Kathy. <laughs> I don't have it here. <laughs> So, so Kathy, I like. I mean, um, in my presentation, the hologram presentation, I Google Glass as a, a one of the areas uh, um, uh, that will be really exciting because what it allows you is to. I mean, it allows you to register the data very uh, quickly uh, as you're seeing the world, and then use the analytics offhand somewhere else and get back the instructions. So, for example, let's say you know you are on a um, on a scene and um, it's it's a kind of an accident scene or something, and and you're trying to resuscitate a patient, and you're putting your um, uh, echocardiogram, and you're getting this information. And in this whole situation, let's say there's a group of experts who are sitting somewhere else on a on a tower, looking at the whole situation, and they're getting this data, and then they're going to be able to relate this information. Um, uh, you know, remotely to the site and enhance the uh, delivery of care at that location based upon all the information that's going to be available and using cognitive tool and you know so much blood is lost, the heart looks it's collapsing, maybe we need to get some extra volume. Maybe it's not going to come rapidly from the scene because it may be something uh, not available uh, quickly, but this may be available very quickly analyzed and that information may be sent back on a Google Glass to a paramedic who's looking, taking care. And these kind of suggestive information, this kind of the multi-parametric based uh, uh, decision analytics has to be relayed somehow, somewhere. Uh, and it's, I think I see the Google Glass as the very easiest way to manage the situation where you're seeing the world, you're experiencing, you're getting that information relayed on top of the event that you're experiencing. So it's, it's, uh, that's, I think something like that is going to be really very helpful. Um, I've thought about, uh, I mean, the current Google Glass doesn't have the full advanced uh, uh, amount of um, uh, visualization, but maybe in potential in future you could relay your entire ultrasound information uh, to a remote expert uh, try to see that ultrasound data on a Google Glass or something like that um, and get some remote suggestions, uh, do some advanced analytics with your own personalized. You just hit your glass and you have your advanced analytics going up there and then you relay back that information, hey, you know, based upon my software and my analytic and my personalized uh, treasure trove of the way I do analysis, I think this is what it is. So, so you want that kind of uh, that kind of uh, liberalization of uh, the use of the computational power and the display, uh, and be able to carry out effectively as you're continuing your life uh, anywhere. You know, that's, that's like going board, to that's like board style uh, pra practice, isn't it? Where not only are you gathering information to do big data, but big data results could be pushed to glass instantly, right in the middle of a of an exam and a, decision, know, a point of decision making. Yeah, you know, for example, you know, I maybe I will go to Manny and say, Manny, you know what? I think I love this, 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 these decision tools that you have developed. This complements my way of doing medicine. And, you know, this is complementary to what I am deficient in my analytical skills. So everybody, nobody's perfect. So I may be deficient in something and I bring the sets of uh, additional analytics, put it on my whatever you want to say, a wrist uh, phone, I mean a smart uh, phone, smart watch, whatever you want to say, a Google Glass, and then you use it efficiently, hands-free, to enhance your analytics. And it's we're, we're not that far away. Are we example of your Go ahead, Manny. I was just going to say, we're not that far away. I was just uh, reading a Juniper report. 80% uh, of uh, devices uh, you know, these mobile devices, 80% will be fitness and healthcare by 2017. <laughs> it's the estimate. So uh, the technology is moving pretty fast. Um, I'd say, you know, this, again, the, to speak about Partho, he, the, his vision uh, all the way from data and, and you know, uh, telehealth um, to, to the future of, you know, point of care and, you know, uh, self care, you know, even, you know patient driven healthcare. It is very, very complete. Um, and so we're pretty excited about the whole future. And I think one, one additional point, as you said, we're, we're all smart about something and don't know about something else. So, so that, too, is where I think you know, bringing that 
collective knowledge to bear for each individual, really capturing other people's experience and then, and then sharing that with others um, is really, I think, a, a beautiful vision for, for kind of future healthcare. Jeff, is your mic working yet? I'm not able to get him. Okay. Um, well, we're running into the end of our time here. It is 8.45, and I don't know um, how many of us have time. Are, are you able to stay a couple more minutes, or should we wrap it up now? We, normally, we have a, a stop at 8.45. Our hard stop is always at 9, so we don't cross into Hickson. But um, I wanted to go ahead and, and get dive a little bit more into this if we have time. Are you both able to join for a couple more minutes? Sure. Okay. Partho, um, I want to go back to something that, that I... I I want to get some more detail on the ideas that you have that you're sharing today and the ideas that you have gone about trying to prove were not always well received were they it's been a, a it's been um, a long journey uh, Kathy um, I came to this country 2003 and uh, you know change is something which is not easy so it takes a lot of um, persistence uh, for example, even to do a simple project like the one we did in India, um, it took some effort before the community was uh, ready to do it, and I'm, I'm glad we did it because that was uh, one of the pivotal um, moments which allowed us uh, to go ahead with some of this futuristic mission, and now I think everybody's on board. So I think there is a like that uh, threshold that you all, we all look for and we reach there, and, and then suddenly everybody becomes a believer. Um, but I think we have really overwhelming evidence right now that this is how this change is inevitable. That's that's what I feel, uh, and I think I'm sure Manny and people like Jeff and a lot of other people's uh, this kind of change of a um, huge machine man machine interaction and augmented reality. These changes are coming. Um, you know, think about how quickly smartphone, social media networks, things like Google Glass. Uh, Things like this are already an X prize for the uh, tricoder, uh, the, uh, the Star Trek uh, uh, in the tricoder. There's already an X prize for that right now. So, and I think in the next one year, we're going to see development of a tricoder that's going to be automated and it's going to detect 14 diseases, including atrial fibrillation, stroke, and this is going to be in hands of people. It's not going to require even a medical personnel to interact. People are going to make decisions based upon their interaction with their smartphones and tricoders. So I think we are evolving very rapidly. It's a very accelerating change right now that we're going through. Well, and that's a nice point that you made because I, I can see where people would be thinking in their heads as they're listening to this conversation that you're a cardiologist. You make money when you run tests. So if you run lots of tests, you make lots of money, at least in the existing healthcare system. So there would be a question of, well, if those tests were not going to be a part of your income, would you still be so proactive about thinking those tests are important in, in diagnostics? And the answer that you just gave is yes, because you're looking beyond your, your billing and you're looking at the portable devices that I could have in my hands and not even have to go through a physician to gather that data, right? Yeah, I think we're going to be evolving. We're going to be doing, personal like you know, cardiologists are going to be doing far more futuristic things. We're going to be modeling. We're going to be taking your data set, putting into our environment. And showing you that, showing you that we're going to change this, we're going to modify this. This is going to be your outcome. This is how many years you're going to get to live. You may not get this, you may get that, and you just make a personalized decision of how you want to live your life. So, I mean, it's going to be way beyond than the primitive, just making a decision, diagnosis, and you get the pills. It's going to be a way more informed. People are going to be smarter. Uh, patients are going to be smarter. They're going to be have much more information than a traditional patient-doctor interaction. They will come prepared with their sets of information and the questions. And I think we are all going to evolve into much more. Uh, uh, it's beautiful. I think. Uh, I think what we're evolving. It. I think it's not driven by um, that you do so many tests and that's that's going to be your truth. But I think the point is that you do as many tests for a given amount of money by using much more efficient automated algorithms you can get that done um, and
uh, it's going to make, it's going to be dependent upon your outcomes rather than the number of that you feel that what you're doing is good for the patient. I mean, it's finally what the patient decides and the outcome that's going to be more important than sitting in a clinic and seeing my throughput that I do so many tests and I earn so much. You're going to be you're going you're going to be valued by what you provide as an outcome for your patients rather than you your value in terms of what revenue you make. And that's going to that's going to determine the outcome is going to determine what revenue you're going to be making in the future. Well, Manny, I have a question for you. Um, of all of the data uh, results that you crunched for for this um, study that Partho did, what was one of the most uh, surprising results or interesting patterns that you were able to uncover in the data? Um, I think. Uh, so first is uh, the, the efficacy of just you know, you know the the accuracy of being able to to classify a disease state is kind of bread and butter. Um, but what was most interesting, and uh, Partho picked up, and it's on the cover of of, uh, of the journal uh, published today, is is a heat map. So um, you know. We're all about you know making the right decision, you know having a model that's that's good in what it says. But I thought it was most interesting to visually see um, you know the comparison of restrictive and a constrictive pattern, and it just was so absolutely clear. <laughs> Even though it's complex and nonlinear and tons of variables, um, the the clarity of the visualization, and again how. Uh, this system can more naturally, you know, speak and work with the physician uh, to show those variables. The, the, the physician can understand those variables. Um, I, I really didn't expect. Um, it was just kind of after we had done the core work um, on, well, you know, how good is it as a classifier uh, that Partha said, well, you know, I'd like to see what's going on. And so uh, the heat map that's on the cover uh, was, for me, personally surprising. That it was that clear and to be that well communicated, you know, visually uh, to to uh, you know to another cognitive system <laughs> we call humans. Well, let, and let's let everybody know what we're talking about for those who have who are not getting the journal and want to find out what you're talking about because I, this is quite interesting. I'm sure some people would like to know. It is on this month's um, JACC cardiovascular imaging. Uh, journal, right? Is that that's the one that was out on, right, Partho? And what was the title of your article? In case people want to Google it. So it, it's a it's a long it's a long uh, article. It's it's, it's uh, um, intelligent platforms for disease assessment, novel approaches in functional echocardiography. Okay. So it can go by intelligent platform. And and you know the cover page actually shows the um, the the three diseases and you can even if you don't know too much of science you can just see the three patterns are so so different and elegant there are actually two patterns and then they then we overlap it and we show that they're they're dissimilar and and it stands out um, how dissimilar they are so so that's the big data and as as, as and at one point I wanted to point out and this may be not it may be trivial for many we uh, looked into close to a uh, full excel spreadsheet of data and they were close to 2 million associations that were being analyzed for a single patient. 2 million association, maybe the number is inaccurate, but that's the kind of associations that were being processed. So, so that heat map actually takes into consideration all these nonlinear association, over millions of data points cross-tallied and compared. This, is, this, is, this was uh, very interesting. Indeed. I wish that we had prepared ahead and had that, that picture to, to flash on the screen. Is there any chance that you'd be able to, to get rights to show that and share just that, that picture on the event page after this conversation is over, maybe in the next couple of days? I think the Jack is, uh, uh, is available online. Maybe we can just put the link mm -hmm. and people can just lo uh, click there and the cover page shows up there. Yes. Okay, that'd be good. So if we could get you to share that link to your article or to the actual um, journal in the event page so that people, when they find this, they can go back and, and learn that 
and we can put it. I'll put it on the YouTube channel as well. And um, also, Manny, if you would put some links to your uh, company in case somebody wants to know how to reach you on that event page, that would be wonderful too. Because I'm sure that there are some people that would like to continue this conversation after this hangout is over. And we are to uh, the point where we do need to wrap this up. As much as I would love to continue talking, um, I hope that we have an opportunity to to learn about new and bigger data studies that you all do and we can share that with the communities in the future. So Kathy, just a one note, I wanted to also people to know about, um, there was a, there's an editor's page written by Jagat Narula, the editor-in-chief, which talks about the data, big data in cardiology, and that's again a great complimentary uh, article uh, and a great contribution uh, that goes hand in hand with the, with the uh, article that I wrote. Yeah, two papers. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that, and I hope that this conversation does continue um, in the healthcare talk community and on the event page. And uh, I hope that that lots of people reach out to these very intelligent, very fun people that I have met, and we continue to learn from all of you. And um, I'll have to pass that on to Jeff, who had to go. He had another um, event that he had to go to. So um, I'm going to say good night to my guests. Thank you, Partha. Thank you, Manny. And Jeff, wherever you are, thank you. And to the viewers who have asked some really wonderful questions and those who will find us afterwards, um, share what you, you appreciate so that your peers can also be in on this conversation. And uh, we're going to wrap it up for tonight. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Kel. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.